cutting off that conversation and beginning to transition to the message, um, I just want to express my uh, gratefulness on behalf of the whole church to really all of the people who are uh, putting in extra time and effort and energy, whether that be um, through the these uh, gifts of music, which require extra rehearsals um, and planning, or the decorations. I'm sure you saw as you arrived uh, the two um, the two baskets out front. Dave and I did not do those. So uh, just ways to help us and encourage us and encourage those that we are ministering to. Uh, to pause and reflect and consider um, that Jesus' birth is truly the reason for the season. So I hope to do that individually as I'm aware of many of you and what, what you've done, but we are grateful to you and we notice it and it, it helps us to, um, to focus on our Savior in a fresh way. Let me give a, a plug for our bookshop um, and uh, particularly as you're heading into gift buying season. This week I'm gonna highlight some resources that parents have used and are used and were recommended to us uh, as a result uh, of us using them. That um, some of which we use downstairs in children's ministry, some of which um, we use in our homes as part of our discipleship uh, of our children and creating a culture in our home where Jesus is uh, talked about. I've been asked by a couple of families, um, are there family Advent devotionals that are simple but, but focused that uh, you would recommend? And one that was recommended to me that I was looking at this week uh, called The Light Before Christmas by Marty Machowski. Uh, Marty is a pastor. He has ministered to us in the past. He's also been involved with some of the curriculum we use downstairs in um, uh, Children. Most importantly, Marty's a father of like six children. And so he's had six go arounds of discipling his kids in the Christ of Christmas. So I commend this to you. Anything we have back there, we're, this is not a revenue stream for us. We, we buy these and then we sell them at, at a loss. Not a significant loss, but a loss so that can be a ministry to use. So perhaps you can't use this, but maybe you know someone who could. I commend that to you. The the light before Christmas. Um, for the youngest kids in our children's ministry, they are being introduced to, again, David Helm's big picture storybook Bible. David is a pastor um, uh, in the Chicago, uh, ministers at th uh, in a church in the Chicago area, downtown. And he created this um, several years ago, which basically takes the whole story of the Bible and looks at it, but keeps the focus on the promise of Christ and the fulfillment of that promise and then Christ's coming and then Christ's kingdom. And so uh, it's outstanding. Uh, I, I've been ministered to personally by David on a number of levels, but I commend this to you. Uh, he did not do the illustrations, but he did write the story. Believe it or not, we read this entire storybook Bible in one message at Crossway when we were in Plainville. We had permission to use this file and did it. That was a long service though, wasn't it? But it made the point that if you, right, wanna understand the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, you don't have to be a scholar. A child could understand it because of the themes and promises that are there. So I commend that to you. Again, it's a big book, it's a heavy book. It's not an expensive book, it's excellent. And then lastly, um, I think the most effective tool, right, in parenting and, and uh, when it comes to resources, is when their parents are reading the Bible, right? When they're reading the word of God and, and it dwells richly in them, then it will come, it will flow from their hearts. So we have a number of books back there, ESV. This is a systematic um, theology study Bible that ESV recently published. Uh, I like how they've, um, They've done it so that primarily you're reading scripture and not reading their notes, but the notes that they provide bring a little more amplification to a theme like in the passage we're in today about the birth of Christ, the incarnation. 
There's a men's devotional Bible back there. There's a women's devotional Bible. They are outstanding. I know some of the contributors, and I highly commend them to you. So parents, be blessed through those resources. Please open in your scriptures to Isaiah chapter 9. Remarkably, my voice has returned. We'll see how long it lasts. God has heard my cry for mercy. So I have the long cold. This is the third week of this cold. But it's a privilege to look at this passage together. We're going to read verses 6 and 7. And then three simple points for our reflection this, this Sunday in Advent where we behold the wonder of Christ, his peace. This is God's word, Isaiah chapter 9, beginning in verse 6. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called, read them with me, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it, with justice and with righteousness, from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Let's pray. Lord, these are familiar words for some of us and for others of us in this room or perhaps via the stream. These beautiful words we've never heard before, but there is an invitation in these words to those who are familiar with them and to those whom these are new words to behold the wonder of Christ. So we pray, we ask, would you still our minds, silence our phones, More importantly, quiet our hearts that we might behold the wonder of the one spoken of here. And in beholding him through scripture, we would open our hearts to him through faith and receive his peace that passes understanding. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Isaiah 9 is a birth announcement. It's a birth announcement. And therefore it is a cause for celebration. This passage, this passage, birth announcement that we just read, so old, this is settled in the hunt centuries before the birth of Christ, talks about who Jesus is and what his arrival means and what his return means, his promised return for our world. This morning and every morning, we, we stand between this birth announcement and the cry at the end of the Bible that John records in his book of Revelation. God has come and come, Lord Jesus. God has come, Isaiah 9 and the announcement by the angels in in Luke, which we will read in a moment. And come, Lord Jesus. The first, the announcement, grounds 
and roots our confidence that the second will be answered. Or as one writer put it this week that I read, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus shape our hope in the return and reign and renewal that is to come. God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, put on flesh and dwelt among us. And Isaiah is proclaiming it years before it happened. But there's coming a time when Jesus will return, not as a baby, not as a sweet little six-pound baby, but as a king. And so we choose We choose, you and I choose. We choose today to open our hearts to Christ Jesus and his kingdom. And to root our hope, we choose to root our hope in his promises, in his reign, and in his return. And he promises peace as we do that. So here's my reflection this morning. Taking notes. My main point, Jim. We experience, we experience the peace of Christ as we open our hearts to him and root ourselves in his reign and his rule and his promises we will experience more peace, the peace of Christ, as we open our hearts to him and root ourselves in his reign and his rule and his promises. And we'll, we'll consider that as we go through it. Simple, as we work through verses six and seven, three simple steps, if you will, headers. First, proclamation then promise, and then peace. First, a proclamation. Perhaps like me, you find peace hard to come by during this season. I think engaging in some healthy self-examination, even fleetingly during a message can be helpful. It is hard to come by peace. Anxiety seems to be crouching at my door, so to speak. There are things in my schedule this week that demand attention this week that seem to exceed both my capacity and my schedule to, and so anxiousness can be experienced. And I know that because when I wake up, that's, those tend to be the things I'm thinking about before my feet hit the bed, or floor rather. Fear. Fear. Fear rooted in the uncertainty of the future. Whether it be something personal and private or whether it be something that, that is before me and before us that is, that is unavoidable. Whether it be a news stream or <clears throat> something everyone seems to be talking about. Fear. Here we go. That is really hot. Loss. Many people have experienced losses in this church. Family members have passed away. Friends are no longer with us for a variety of reasons. And we carry, we carry that 
that loss. It's at times unavoidable. And maybe not you. I, I don't come to this easily, but I think amongst a younger generation, they do, for whatever reason, and that's not a criticism. Despair. Despair. And I'm, I'm talking about talking with Christian millennials. And what I hear consistently is difficulties that they feel or face and at times a note of despair. And it's not just a certain emotional makeup or a certain things that, that I had taken for granted perhaps they see as uncertain and it creates And so there is, in this season of Advent, a longing for peace that is more than a schedule that is lightened or a good night's sleep. And I want to make the argument today that when we root ourselves, root ourselves, our hopes and our fears our anxious thoughts and our Lord have mercy thoughts in the reign and rule and promises of God. Jesus promises us peace, peace. And I think these passages we're looking at encourage that. So that's the proclamation. Here's the announcement. Christ has come. Christ is with us. He's been born already. Christ has died and been risen again and has said to his followers, I am with you to the end of the age. Christ is here. Christ is here with you now. Christ is here with me now. Christ is here with us now. And if he's here with us now, he brings Peace. Somebody say amen. amen. But to crudely quote John Newton, whose devotional I was reading this week, I was sharing this with the worship team as we prayed together. The peace that Christ brings is not a what, it's not a thing, it's not a commodity. It's not an item you put on your wish list. The peace that Christ offers us is a who. It's a who. It's him. It's him. It's him. He is our peace. Amen? Amen. So when I say root ourselves... In the reign of Christ, when I say root ourselves in the promises of God, when I say root ourselves in, in these passages in order to open ourselves more to him, I'm saying we need more of him, him, because he is the Prince of Peace. So let's consider this together. The promises of God, second point. The birth announcement by Isaiah is telling you and me that hidden down, hidden down deep in the announcement to Isaiah that to us a child is born, to us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Hidden down, deep, and woven into this promise made long ago is a deeper purpose, a deeper mercy of God that he is bringing to this train wreck called this world. And it is good news. It is purely good news. It is pure 
gospel. Do you realize there is not a single word in what I just read? And if there is, you show me, because maybe I missed it. There's not one syllable in what I just read about what I have to do or what I do next. This is all about what God is going to do and has done and will continue to do. As he sends his son into this world, God is saying, I am here to help us. I am here to save you, not reluctantly, not resentfully, not fearfully. I am here, and this is good news. So, to bring it forward, when the angel announces that in Luke 2, that unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, I now say and I choose to rejoice at this moment in this reality. Christ is here today. Christ is ours today. Christ is now among us today. And he is so big. He is so good. He is so merciful that in proclaiming his birth and what he is going to do, he is saying, I am all in with your life. I am putting all all of me in to your life, and I am putting all of me in to my purposes. This is not a campaign promise. This is a blood-sealed covenant promise that goes all the way back to Genesis, running right through Abraham, through Noah, into the Davidic kingdom, all the way to its fulfillment. And it has happened. It is happening. It will happen. Because as Isaiah concluded that section, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do it. Amen? This passage, I'll get in trouble with this at elders, but that's all right. A little trouble now and then helps me grow. This Christmas passage is not about the teachings of Jesus. And they're wonderful. We see that in Mark's gospel. This is not about the miracles of Jesus, although the birth of Christ is a miracle. We can go into that. But it's not about the miracles that he did in his earthly ministry. It's not about the cross of Jesus or his resurrection, although we know the rest of the story. This is about the birth of the person of God, who he is, who he will always be, and who he will be for us. To us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called. You see how those lines are stacked up, one against another against another? Don't know much about Hebrew, but I know this. When, when the writer piles up those lines, he's doing it for emphasis. And this emphasis adds meaning. And this meaning makes an exclamation point. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in weakness, as a baby, his kingdom was already established and it was secure. Come on. Come on. All the forces of evil through down the ages are arrayed against God and his purposes. All the, the nations that have served evil are arrayed against God and his purposes. All of that is stacked up. And you mean to tell me that when God re- replies and responds and he leads out, Right? Onto the battlefield, so to speak, if you can picture a moment like that. And you've got, you know, 
It's like out of a Lord of the Rings, Peter Jackson move me. All the evil on one side and they're ready to attack. And the horn sounds and here comes God's army and out it comes and it's a baby. It's an infant. It's, God's ways are always surprising, aren't they? And God's answer is not of this world. God's answer to all the evil that has been stacked up against his kingdom and his purposes. It's his infant son. That is God's super weapon. Friends, this child is for you if you're via joining us on the stream. It's for me too. It's for all of us. It's for the whole world. Anyone can get in on this. The announcement of the child brings with it this promise that he is meant for you. Let's look at each of the titles one at a time. Wonderful. Wonderful doesn't merely mean impressive. It means miraculous. Because the wonderful counselor not only knows you, he understands you and he understands me and he understands the miraculous memories that will actually help us. He's offering you and I something new from above that brings peace. So if you've ever wondered, how am I going to get out of this mess? How am I going to get out of this mess in order to have peace? How am I going to get out of this this mess that has robbed me of life and restore my sense of order and peace? He understands that. And that's why his next title brings hope. Mighty God. The wonderful counselor who understands us is a mighty God, meaning warrior-like. He's like a warrior. And yet, he comes as a human being. He's born as a baby, so he's a mighty warrior, but he's clothed in weakness. It's as if weakness is the way the gospel works. Weakness is the way Jesus is received. Who can stop weakness? The mighty warrior. He comes as an everlasting father. This is not a Trinitarian statement according to several scholars, although we believe in the Trinity, the mystery of that. Here in Isaiah, it means that Jesus the Messiah, the promised Savior, spoken of here, permanently will take responsibility of us as his own, his kids. As he said in John 14, the last night of his life, I will not leave you as orphans. Why? Because he is our everlasting father. And finally, he is the prince of peace. The prince of peace. And of the increase of his peace, there will be no ends. His cross will win. And he will win over some of his enemies. And he will make them his friends. He doesn't force himself upon someone. But through his great love and merciful, merciful surrender to his father's will. When we say, okay, Lord, you win, I'm all in. He, he becomes our Prince of Peace. Here's the best part to me of the increase. I love that word. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be 
no end. That means that the kingdom that Jesus inaugurated and began through his birth and that earthly ministry, the kingdom that he spoke of, by which we, in receiving him by, through repentance of our sins and faith in him, we, we belong now to a new kingdom, the kingdom that Jesus is king in, this new kingdom of peace of shalom, of sanity, of wisdom, everything we value and long for, this new empire, if you will, of Jesus' kingdom will, will forever succeed. And if we welcome his rule now, if we receive him now, if we believe in him and surrender our lives to him, we will still be standing when all the kingdoms of this world collapse in exhaustion and his kingdom goes on forever. I'm not a missiologist, obviously, I'm just Bauer. But as of today, today, there are less than eight billion people in the world and two and a half billion of them purport to be Christians. Two and a half billion purport. Not in the West where we see a diminishing, but in the Southern Hemisphere. The stories coming out of India right now are astounding. One story, which I just heard, and it's on Facebook, so I guess I couldn't verify it, and it's, I trust this person because I've been there. But one church there in one city, a major city, you could fit maybe 10 Bostons in this city, right, meets in one part of the city, but they decided to put in another part of this very large city. Basically, we would call it probably the equivalent of a daycare. So you have a church in one part of the city and it's against the law and there's all kinds of issues with Christians being in this part of India because of the fame of this one city. But they decided to put this ministry base in another part of the city. And they said very clearly, we're Christians, but we want to take care of the children that in this part of the city where you are, you've discarded because they have a cleft lip or they have a facial informity or they, they have a physical deformity. Or, and because of their beliefs in that part of the city and their superstitions too, they just discard these kids. And so you go, right, to this, this clinic, and I've been there. And of course, it's just teeming with, with children, Hindu children and other children, not Christian children. And all the workers there are are believers. And there's pictures of Jesus on the wall, and there's Bibles and Hindi and Sanskrit there. And, and, um, and so recently there was a riot that broke out in this part of the city. Like, I mean, not like a riot like, you know, I don't know, that occurs on 495 when there's an accident and people get all mad and, you know, yell at each other. But I mean a riot where there's violence and there's torches burning and do you know the one building that was untouched by the riot? It's the Christian building that cares for the children that that culture has discarded. And now, as a result, right, because of all the rubble, it's expanding. They're, they're adding. And but because they're adding, now they have to have people start to move and live there from this church. And so they're now in that community. And you're just starting to see, oh, wait a second. His kingdom's increasing. It's unstoppable. Now, I was told when I was there, Bauer, do not stand out on a street corner alone with your patriot swag on. You will be kidnapped and know your family's not going to pay a ransom for you. If you're that dumb, because I'd like to stand out and take pictures and look and 
So this is amongst a group of people, right, whom do not have these Christians that are ministering, do not have the riches that we have. They have scriptures, but they don't have the teaching that we have. They don't have the, they don't have the playlists. They don't have, they don't have so many, they don't have, dec- they have so little, but what they have is Christ. They don't have a what, they have a who. And the who is increasing his kingdom. Isn't that amazing? When we welcome his rule into our lives, the things that are exhausting us, the things that we think will secure our peace, but in the end, seemingly exhaust us, are God's merciful messengers that are saying, there's peace but it's not a what, it's a him. Turn to him. I'm saying to Christians, look to him. Open your heart again to him. Because it says here, of the increase of his peace, there will be no end. God says it in the Bible, watch his kingdom, watch for the increase and where his kingdom is increasing, where people are being not only reconciled to God through faith in Christ and repenting of their sins and receiving pardon through his death and resurrection for the forgiveness of our sins, there is an increase of the peace of God as they root their lives in the reign and rule of promises of God. And the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this, which is my final point. We have a proclamation We have the promise of peace, and we have now the peace itself. What is it that secures your and my peace forever? It's the zeal of the Lord, the passion of God moving through history. It's the promise and passion of God in the heart of God as he moves all of history to the triumph of his son, I love that word, zeal. It, it's rendered by some, literally the word fire. And I think what it communicates in verse 7 is that when we are disheartened, God is just warming up. When, when we become discouraged... God is just warming up. When we are overwhelmed, he is rejoicing in the kingdom of his son and his kingdom, his kingdom is increasing. His kingdom is everlastingly increasing. His kingdom is moving forward because God is not passive. He is not passive. He is not passive when it comes to our rooting our lives in his son and finding our peace in him. So how do we do this? How do we close this reflection with a practical application as we get ready to return to singing? Flip with me in your your Bibles to Luke chapter one at Mary's song of praise, Luke chapter one. She's visiting her, her relative, Elizabeth, with the news that she is carrying the Messiah. And Mary begins to sing in verse 46, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. So she's rooting, right? She's rooting her hope, she's rooting her joy, she's rooting her faith in the reign and rule of God through the revelation of the Messiah. And then she says this in verse 53. He has filled the hungry 
with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. Keep your finger there. Go back to Isaiah. I know I'm asking you to do some gymnastics today. Verse one of chapter nine, verse two. Where was the Messiah sent first? He was born in Bethlehem, but where was he sent first in his earthly ministry? He was sent to the land of Zebulun. He was sent to the land of Naphtali. He was sent to the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people of Galilee had the deepest history of suffering amongst the Israelite people. Due to their northernmost location, they were the ones that were repeatedly invaded by foreign armies. They were always the first ones hit. They had the deepest history of loss and pain and injury and suffering. It's these people. And Jesus begins his ministry there. In other words, who are the people foremost on his heart? To whom does Jesus in ministry move towards first? He moves towards the people who are most despairing, most wounded, most injured, maybe treated as most expendable, or told they're not important, told they don't count, told they're not a priority. It's not that God through Christ doesn't love privileged people or wealthy people or powerful people. He gets around to them if they are open to him. But Jesus has a special place in his heart for the brokenhearted. And if that is you, you are the one he came for. You are very much on his heart this Christmas season. So I dare you, I dare you, defy, defy your own regrets and embarrassments and difficulties and failures and sins, defy them and move all of your chips, so to speak, onto the square that is Jesus. Move them all there. And this is what will happen, as Mary said. He will fill your empty hands with peace. He will satisfy your hungry hearts with himself. He will give you himself. Not a what, but a who right in the midst of the unrest of your world and the mess that is our world as we look to the Lord this Advent. Two scriptures to close with. Therefore, as Christ, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, Colossians 2, rooted and built up in him and established in in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. We will experience the peace of Christ as we root ourselves in his reign and rule and promises. And do not be anxious, Philippians 4, about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition. With thanksgiving, let our requests be known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. 
Father, we thank you for the gift of your son, the Prince of Peace. And as those who live between the announcement of his birth and the promise of his return, we pray even now, Lord, as we sing this closing song, that you would, you would position us, you would help us, you would assist us, you would assist me to open my heart to him. To receive not a what, but to receive more of a who, of him. To submit, to submit my fears, my concerns, my self-dependencies, to him. And in doing that, Lord, would you fill my heart, fill my heart with the celebration that is Christ's birth. No one hears a birth announcement and says sorry or No, we hear a birth announcement with excitement. Lord, lead us. Lead us to celebrate. Not only that he came, but he's here with us. And his kingdom is increasing because the zeal of the Lord of hosts is doing it. And we're a part of it or we can join it today and behold with wonder the Christ of peace. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.